Hi, this is Physics 503, Nuclear Physics, and in this lesson, we are going to have an overview of the research reactors. In this lesson, we are going to discuss what, what a research reactor is, the applications of your research reactors, some types of your research reactors, and in the last part, we are going to talk about the PR1 Saturn, which is the Philippines' own version of a research reactor. Your nuclear fission reactors are devices used to initiate and control a chain of nuclear fission reaction. Just for a quick review, when a strain neutron hits a heavy nuclei, like say for example in this, lake, in this case, your uranium-235, this neutron is absorbed creating an unstable nuclei, your, your uranium-236. This then splits into fission fragments as this is unstable and also produces energy and more neutrons. This energy produced during the fission reaction is used by your nuclear power plants to produce or generate electricity. On the other hand, these neutrons or uh, these more neutrons that are produced after the fission reaction is used by your research reactors in different applications. In the Philippine setting, we have the Bataan Nuclear Power Plant, which was not commissioned, and we have the ERR-1 or the Philippine Research Reactor 1 as an example of your research reactor. Your PRR-1, however, is still under shutdown. Let us elaborate more what a research reactor is. Basically, a nuclear reactor that is applied primarily to generate and apply neutron and ionizing radiation for the purpose of research, production of radionuclides, and similar are your research reactors. It consists of a reactor core and experimental devices and other facilities and equipment associated with the operation and utilization program of the facility. This is an example here of a research reactor taken from the IAEA. This is here is a schematic diagram of the principal parts of a nuclear reactor. Now, of course, we have here your nuclear fuel, which fissions to produce these neutrons. Also, you have here your moderator, a material which slows down neutrons so that more fission can occur in the fuel. Remember that what we want here are thermal neutrons. You also have your reflector, this one here which minimizes the number of neutrons that are leaking out of the core. And we have the control rod, which helps control the neutron population in the core. And of course, the vessel, which contains all the components. Now remember that heat is also produced in the fission process, and there should be a way in which heat is removed, which is here provided by the coolant. In this case, your coolant comes in, and goes into a loop, taking out heat out of your core. These are other informations about the main components of a research reactor. For the fuel, it can either be natural uranium or enriched uranium. And the main difference between the fuel of a nuclear power reactor and a research reactor is that for your research reactor, your uranium can be enriched above 20%. In terms of form, it can either be metal form, alloy, oxide, or silicide. And for the cladding, we can use aluminum, zirconium, or stainless steel. For example, in your Philippine Research Reactor 1, fuel is a uranium zirconium hydride fuel. For the moderators, you can either use your light water or your heavy water, graphite, and beryllium. The same materials are used as reflector in your research reactor. And you can use uh, any, com any combination of both. For the control rods, you can use boron, cadmium, and nickel. And for the coolant, you can use water, gas, or sodium. And of course, your vessel, it contains all of the components here. The basic physics involved in your research reactors are the same physics that we see in your nuclear power reactors. This includes your interaction of neutrons with matter, 
the criticality, role of delayed neutrons, radioactive decay, and of course, your thermohydraulic. In here is your critical, criticality graph, or your critical, criticality graph, wherein this is the state in which a nuclear chain reaction is self-sustaining, that is when reactivity is zero. So what we have here, your, uh, your K effective, this is the effective neutron multiplication factor, and this is the, uh, the unit of measurement of your criticality. What we always want is when your criticality is equal to 1, which is your critical environment, your K effective that's less than 2, 1 is what you call your subcritical environment, and your K, K effective that's greater than 1 is your supercritical environment. Your K effective that's less than 2, 1 is when there are lesser neutrons that are produced in your fission reaction, and when your K effective is greater than 1, this is when you have more uh, neutrons that are produced using uh, during your fission reaction. So these uh, things here are still involved in your research reactors, same with your nuclear power reactors. These are other general features of your research reactors. Your research reactors have pores that have smaller volume, typically because your fuel have higher enrichment than your power reactors. And for low-powered research reactors, natural convection is enough for heat to flow out of your core, but for high-powered research reactors, we should have your forced cooling. Your research reactors also has pulsing capability, wherein you can produce short bursts of energy. And unlike your 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 power reactors, your research reactor can provide access inside a core, along the core boundary, and from external beams. Typically, the power range for your research reactors is around 100 kilowatts to 10 megawatts, and it has a typical steady state neutron flux of around 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14, 14 neutron per centimeter squared seconds. This is here is a schematic diagram of an example of a research reactor. Of course, you have here your reactor core, and then you also, which also contains your reflector and fuel elements, and then you have your water inlet and water outlet for cooling, and then you have here a heavy concrete for biological shielding. Of course, your control and safety rods, and then your uh, you have a standard concrete, and then you also have here a traveling traveling bridge, which allows for the movement of your core. You have here your thermal column and your beam port, and then your beam port door to allow access to your neutrons. So this design here is actually similar to the design of the Philippine Research Reactor 1 in the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. We now cover the uh, different applications of your research reactor, and we are going to cover this one, one by one. If you actually want more information about this one, you can look up your IE, IAEA, Nuclear Energy Series number N, NP-5.3, uh, wherein you can have more information about this research reactor utilization, utilization or your research reactor applications. Your research reactor can be used in uh, education and training, wherein every functioning research reactor facility, irrespective of, of its operational power, can be used for education and training. When reviewing the potential uses of existing reactors, this type of application is not to be dismissed as being a trivial or unprofitable mission. On the contrary, it needs to be thoroughly explored and utilized to the benefit of the facility as much as the university faculty commitments and facility staff revenue requirements allow. Educating the public to be more uh, knowledgeable of nuclear affairs usually results in less opposition and potentially more support on related issues for uh, public awareness. Similarly, educating and training the scientific and industrial communities relates to a marketing exercise 
to entice future customers and users of available facilities. That is your stakeholder engagement. Education and training programs can encompass all facets of civil society from primary students and the general public through public tours and visits or public tours to university courses and power reactor operator training. So we can have uh, practical exercises and clear education courses related to education and training. We also use your research reactor for nuclear or core measurements and benchmark where in nuclear quantities such as reactor physics and kinetic parameters can be measured and also your reactor data can be used to validate simulation codes and nuclear data that there is. So if you have a simulation of, of a, a nuclear activity, you can use your research reactor to validate your results. Your research reactor can also be used in neutron activation analysis or your NAA. Your neutron activation analysis is a method for the qualitative and quantitative determination of elements based on the measurement of characteristic radiation from radionuclides formed directly or indirectly by neutron irradiation of the materials. The most suitable source of neutrons for such an application is usually a nuclear research reactor and your neutron activation analysis can be performed in a variety of ways depending on the, the element and the corresponding radiation levels to be measured, as well as on the nature and extent of the interference from other elements present in the sample. Next to education and training, neutron activation analysis is the most widely used application of your research reactors. Almost any uh, reactor in excess of 10 to 30 kilowatts is capable of providing a sufficient neutron flux to irrigate samples for selective applications of neutron activation analysis. The cost of setting up an NAA facility is relatively low compared with the cost of neutron beam instruments. Since many of the use, uses of trace elements determination can be directly linked to the potential economic benefits, neutron activation analysis is to be regarded as a key component of most research reactors' strategic plans. Selected applications of your neutron activation analysis is in uh, environmental analysis, food analysis, and forensics. Just for example, if you know Tycho Brahe, which is the mentor of Johannes Kepler, there was actually a um, issue with, uh, with his death because it was thought that he may have died also of, of poisoning but it was done just recently by a neutron activation analysis and it was confirmed that he was actually that he actually died of natural cause and not of of of, uh, of poisoning so that's an example um, application of your neutron activation analysis the use of research reactors for geochronology is a more specialized application reasonable power levels are required and the user base is a relatively small but, wide, but widespread group of geologists from many universities and institutions. In addition, there is a tendency towards loyalty to the reactor facilities that are currently utilizing geochronological equipment owing to the lengthy facility calibrations normally required for such equipment. A dating method where the age of small quantities of minerals in milligrams can be determined based on the amount of your K40. Fission track geochronology is a method for dating minerals containing uranium, particularly apatites and zircon. Radioisotopes have a wide range of applications in various fields, including nuclear medicine, industry, agriculture, and research. They are produced mainly in research reactors and accelerators, involving several interrelated activities such as target fabrication, irradiation, transportation of irradiated targets to processing facilities, radiochemical processing or, or encapsulation in sealed sources, quality control, and transportation to end users. The production of radioisotopes of in reactors is based on neutron capture in a target materi material, either by activation or generation of radioisotopes from fission of the target material by bombardment with thermal neutrons. 
research to develop a new radioisotopes for diagnostics and therapy in nuclear medicine, non-destructive testing and radio tracer industrial applications, as well as for radio tracer studies and scientific research, provides excellent participation opportunities for research reactors and cyclotrons. For medical applications, your isotope production can be used in diagnostic and therapeutic. For industrial applications, you can use it in moisture density gauges, gauges for thickness level, non-destructive testing, and radiation processing. For the agriculture and the environment testing, you can use it as tracer studies or for environmental mon monitoring. Transmitting effects. This category includes those applications in which neutrons or gamma radiation are used to bring about a change in the material properties. The transmutation effects under discussion usually require significant fluences to induce the effects within a reasonable time period. This requires the application of medium and higher powered research reactors. Additionally, to produce sufficient quantities of product to make it worthwhile, fairly large uniform flux irradiation positions are often required. For your transmutation effect, we have your silicon doping, gamma irradiation, gemstone coloration, and actinide transmutation. Silicon transmutation doping has this process which is called your neutron transmutation doping, doping or NTD. This is defined as the process of creating impurities in an intrinsic or extrinsic semiconductor by neutron irradiation, thereby increasing its value for various applications. The targets or candidate materials for NTD include gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, gallium phosphide, germanium, indium, indium phosphide, indium selenide, mercury, cadmium telluride, and silicon, among others. Of this, silicon is the currently the only target utilized for commercial neutron transmutation doping applications and is the most widely internationally used semiconductor material. NPD technology is a preferential method for the production of extremely high sil uh, quality silicon semiconductors due to its extremely uniform dopant concentration. As a result of the ability to provide excellent product quality, the demand for NTD of silicon has become an internationally significant commercial opportunity. Gamma radiation, irradiation, on the other hand, can be readily be developed with a relatively small in investment at a research reactor, for example, for irradiating plants and seeds. If fuel assemblies are utilized, the dose rate achievable is dependent on reactor power and cooling time. Fuel element storage racks can be used to hold the assemblies during the gamma irradiation, and very little extra is needed with respect to the facilities, equipment, personnel, and funding. Gemstone coloration, which is an interesting application of transmutation effect, is uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about. Gemstones may be irradiated either with neutrons or gamma quanta of high energy of the order of several tens of mega electron volt produced by electron beams to improve their properties. For example, changing to a more desirable color to increase their appeal and monetary value. One of the more significant commercial neutron irradiation activities currently being performed at research reactors is the coloration of topaz. The following information is pertinent to topaz irradiation. However, before proceeding to gemstone coloration, the legality of this activity must be verified with national authorities as several states have banned the practice. Similar to NPD of silicon, there is a potential for the, for the generation of a significant income through gemstone irradiation. Unfortunately, due to the commercial sensitivity, there is an understandable reluctance among those performing their irradiation to disclose the specific details of their processes. In particular, for both NTD and gemstone applications. In addition, there are some difficulties associated with gems, gem, gemstone coloration activities that need to be heeded. For um, actinide transmutation, it has been recognized for many years that it is 
theoretically possible to transmute some long-lived actinides and spent nuclear fuel into shorter-lived products, thereby reducing the potential waste disposal hazard. To this end, some actinide burners have been designed, but none has yet built has yet been built for this specific purpose. It is possible that some reactors may be utilized in the future for test irrigation of fuel plates or elements. The sensitivity of light elements to the absorption of neutrons compared with X-ray imaging provides neutron imaging with an advantage in both 2D and 3D visualizations. Until the 1990s, the dominant detection systems for neutron imaging were film-based. That is, you have X-ray film and converters, converters with track edge foils, and known simply as neutron radiography. Since then, detection methods have been improved drastically, Digi uh, digital processing systems have been introduced, and imaging beamlines have been built with the capability to scan in energy through the range in which structural materials show Bragg diffraction edges. In this figure here, you can compare the image form by uh, neutron imaging and X-ray radiography. As you can see, we can see more components inside your ca camera with neutron imaging as than your X-ray radiography. Two interactions of neutrons with matter make neutron scattering a unique probe for materials, materials research, namely short range strong nuclear interactions and electromagnetic interactions due to the net neutronic magnetic moment. In particular, as neutrons have no net electric charge, they can penetrate, penetrate the, bulk, the bulk of materials, making metallic objects largely transparent to their transmission. Furthermore, Thermal neutrons play a crucial role among many other engineering functions in, the, in locating light atoms such as hydrogen and oxygen in intricate structures, resolving the arrangement of magnetic moments in complex magnetic systems, and accessing residual stress distribution in mechanical components. Typical example may include hydrogen storage materials, electrolytes and battery materials, and magnetic films. Isotopic substitution is exploited to elucidate the precise location of hydrogen atoms, for example, in polymers and biological uh, molecules. So uh, material structure and dynamic studies is what is usually used in your neutron imaging. And this is one of the first techniques of choice for detailed characterization of atomic and magnetic structures and dynamics for new classes of materials and their processing. High intense positron beams are of major interest in various fields of physics. The positron annihilation technique is applied in solid state physics, material science, and surface physics, in which positrons are used as non destructive microprobe or defect studies owing for their high sensitivity to open volume defects. In atomic and nuclear physics, scattering experiments with positron and positronium, as well as the investigation of positron, positronium and its excited states require intense positron beams. When boron-10 absorbs a neutron, it emits an alpha particle, which is highly ionizing and has a range in tissue about equal to the diameter of a cell. The reaction is, you have a neutron absorbed by boron-10, produces an alpha particle and lithium-6. The applicable methodology in boron neutron carbon therapy or BNCT is thus to inject a tumor with a borated compound that irradiates it with thermal neutrons. If the conditions are right, the tumor dose is much higher than that of the rest of the surrounding tissue, resulting in the preferential eradication of the tumor cells. Thermal neutrons are desired at the tumor location because the boron-10 interaction probability is much higher with slower neutrons. Surface or shallow tumors can therefore be irradiated with thermal neutrons 
while those at a depth of a few centimeters can be irradiated with epithermal neutrons, which are then thermalized as they pass through and interact with the overlying tissue. Thermal neutrons are also useful for BNCT research involving cell cultures or small animal irradiations. Although most of the neutron capture therapy currently practiced makes use of boron compounds, other compounds such as gadolinium can also be used. The majority of neutron capture therapy research is focused on malignant melanomas and brain tumors, particularly glioblastoma multiform. Current research efforts are directed towards providing the dose of the, to the tumor in a short period of minutes instead of hours and reducing the dose to normal tissue through higher flux, better neutron energy selectors, shielding and collimation, and better drugs. One of the major applications of research reactors, whether low, medium, or high power, is the ability to be utilized to perform testing and calibration experiments. This can be applied to various types of instrumentation, as well as to materials intended for use in either fuel, in either nuclear fuels or reactor structural components. Some aspects of such applications are your uh, IC testing or IC testing, nuclear fuel testing, and material testing. These are the distribution of your research reactors by applications. The blue, the, the blue bar is for the number of research reactors involved, and the green bar is for the number of host countries. As you can see, teaching and training is, up, is at the top with 172 research reactors involved. And this is followed by your neutron activation analysis and radioisotope production. Other applications are also at the top of the list, which are not discussed here. It is also important to talk about the research reactor safety. And these are the fundamental safety functions that need to be addressed. You have your control of reactivity or neutron population the cooling of the core, and confinement of radioactive materials. The following IAEA safety standards can be used as guidelines for the safety of research reactors, and another one is also for the safety assessment for research reactors and preparation of the safety analysis report. The safety factors is actually a comprehensive list which includes facility design, Actual condition of SSCs, important to safety, equipment qualification, aging, utilization, deterministic safety analysis, including hazard analysis, operating experience, use of experience from other research reactors and research findings, organization, the management system, system and safety culture, procedures management, human factors, emergency planning, operational radiation protection, and radiologic impact with the environment. Based on IAEA, as of November 2020, we have 221 operational research reactors, uh, wherein we have 88 in developing countries. 11 are under construction, 7 are in developing countries, 15 plan, 13 of which are, are from developing countries. 15 temporarily shut down, including here is your PRR1. And 13 are in extended shutdown. Uh, 59 are in permanent shutdown. And 444 are in the commission. 150 facilities with first criticality uh, more than 40 years ago. As you can see here, many of the research reactors are in the commission with a number of up to 444. And this is because when, when your research reactor already fulfilled or already finished the project or has already uh, finished the uh, research going on, it can already be directly decommissioned. And also, research reactors are more easily be decommissioned as compared to your, your power reactors. So this is the same data for your uh, research reactors in the world, in the world, just in table form. 
So totally we have 133 operational in develop, developed countries and 88 in developing countries. 413 are uh, decommissioned in develop, developed countries and 31 are uh, decommissioned in developing countries. In terms of country distribution, as you can see, most of the research reactors that are operating are found in industrialized countries. But there is also an increasing trend for research reactors in, in developing countries. Research reactors are distributed over 56 member states and uh, most of the research reactors are concentrated in the USA with 307 and 50 plant, Russia with 124, 52 plant, Germany with 4 to 6, 5 plant, France with 39 and 3 plant, and Japan 29, 3 plant, and lastly have China with 24 and 16 plant. This is the power distribution of the research reactors in the world. So most uh, reactors have greater than one kilowatt of around 27%. And it's, uh, we have re research reactors that uh, uh, power distribution from one kilowatt to 100 kilowatts. And uh, the smallest one is a research reactor with less than or equal to 100 megawatts of uh, power which is only around 3%. For the age distribu distribution, many of our research reactors of around 41% have age uh, 40 to 49 years. And it's followed by re research reactors aging 30 to 39. And you have your research reactors um, aging 20 to 29 with 16% and it's followed by research reactors aging 50 to 59 years old. For the distribution by type, unlike your power reactors wherein we can easily group your re reactors by type, um, your research reactors have huge variety and there's no easy categorization. For example, we can uh, group them by manufacturer types you have your Slopo, MNSR, Argonaut, Triga, IRT, or WWR. We can also group them by coolant or moderator. You have your heavy water pool, light water, liquid metal, and organic. We can also group them uh, in terms of fuel type, the plate, Triga, rods, and homogeneous. And of course, for the purpose, um, you can group them by critical assembly, research, test, training, or prototype. We can also group them in terms of power level, zero power, low power, medium power, and high power. And the criticality state, you can group them into subcritical or critical. This is the research reactor database, database of the IADA, which you can view later. This is um, constantly updated for you to view uh, research reactor statuses in different regions and in different countries. Now let's discuss some selected reactor power types. You have your AKR reactors, argonaut reactors, slow poke reactor or the miniature neutron source, your MTR reactors, trigger reactors, and subcritical reactors. The AKR reactor is from the German Ausbildung Kern reactor which directly translate to neutron training reactor. Some technical data about AK reactors. The power is uh, around 100 megawatts to 10 watts. The fuel material is U308 mixed with polyethylene. And enrichment is less than 20% with maximum neutron flux density of 2.5 times 10 to the 7. It has the following experimental facilities, three horizontal, Two vertical channels and one thermal column. So it basically contains the same or the basic components of a uh, research reactor. This one here is an image of the AKR-1 reactor in Dresden. This one here, this barrel here, 
here contains your AKR reactor and around it are your nuclear scientists and as you can see the scientists are working close to your reactor which tells us that the post the threat of uh, radiation by the AKR reactor is very small. The next type of research reactor that we're going to talk about is the Argonaut reactor which contains the following technical data a power up to 100 kilowatts the fuel is uranium aluminum and the enrichment is 93 percent for the old type and less than 23 percent for the new type some experimental facilities include two horizontal beam ports one vertical channel one thermal column two pneumatic transfer system and close to core radiation positions Next, we have your slow poke reactor or the miniature neutron source. The power can be produced is up to or power use is 20 kilowatts. UL type is uranium aluminum. UL type is rods. And this RD enrichment, 93% for old type and 20%, less than 20% for the new type. Um, it contains fiber reflector radiation facilities, four X-core irrigation facilities, and one pneumatic transfer system. And this is the schematic diagram of the slowpoke at the University of Alberta. And as you will see, many of the universities now has um, research reactors because uh, these research reactors are used in educating new breeds of uh, reactor scientists and also for research. Then we have the MTR reactor, which is a material testing reactor. Some technical data. We have a power up to 20 megawatts. Fuel type is uranium aluminum. Fuel type is plates. And then um, it contains 10 horizontal channels, 4 for irrigation facilities, 12 reflector irrigation facilities, and 2 pneumatic transfer system. So your material testing reactor, MTR. Then we have your TRIGA reactor. TRIGA basically stands for Training Research Isotope Production and General Atomics. So the acronym stands for the research reactor, where the research reactor is used for and its manufacturer, manufacturer the General Atomics. It has main advantages that uh, it is simple in design, inherently safe, easy to operate, and relatively cheap. Some technical data for your trigger reactor. The power is 30 kilowatts to 14 megawatts. Fuel type is um, uranium, zirconium, and hydrogen. Fuel type is rods. Enrichment is 70% for the old type and less than 20% for the new type. And the last that we're going to talk about are your subcritical reactors. We're going to talk. Uh, we're going to emphasize um, your subcritical reactors, as this is the type of reactor that we are building in the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. It has two main characteristics: flexibility and accessibility to the experimental assembly, and low level of nutrient flux of several orders of magnitude lower than low power research reactors. It has two categories of potential application: one application for your subcritical reactor is fully efficient and applications for which your subcritical react reactor will serve as a demonstration facility. And we have two different uh, sub uh, S SCAs that could be considered. First is the inherent subcritical assembly. So SCAs stand for your subcritical assembly. Physically cannot be critical because the natural uranium and light water or, or insufficient amount of fuel elements in the core. And the subcritical assembly, where such a uh, facility don't want the authorization for a critical set point, but from a safe, safety point of view, it is similar to a zero power reactor, wherein the lattice has the physical capability to be critical. So, these are the uh, number of subcritical reactors around the world. 
So we have around thir uh, 34. So under construction or this one, uh, this uh, data here do not get include uh, the Philippines. But if you're going to include the Philippines, we have one which is under construction. And, and we have 15 operational. And we have eight that are um, the commission. So these are the subcritical reactors distribution around the world. Many of the SRs are located located in the Russian Federation. The Philippines is actually not a newcomer when it comes to research reactors. This is a brief history. We have your Philippine Research Reactor 1, where in, in 1955, we obtained under the USA Atoms for Peace Program a project for uh, a research reactor. In 1963, it attained its first criticality as a material testing reactor type. And in 1964, it was first operated at 1 megawatts. From 1964 to 1984, for 20 years, it was used in various um, applications in research and also in training. And then in 1984, it was decided to be upgraded to 3 megawatts trigger reactor. The upgrading finished in, in 1988, and then it was initially found to be successful. However, after some week, uh, weeks, there were some issues found until it was it was decided that it will be for shutdown. So the issues were not fixed until 2005, wherein the PRR1 was considered for the commissioning. However, in 2014, there was an alternative endpoint considered for PRR1 as um, not to waste the um, the un unspent nuclear fuel. So this one here, uh, as you can see, is an egg, egg shape um, structure. This is where your your PR1 is located. And this is still very much present today in the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. So for the current status, we have 115 slightly irrigated three fuel rods in wet storage and 15 fresh fuel in dry storage. So this is the reason why in 2014 there was an alternative um, alternative plan for your year one instead of it being the commission. So without an operator operating nuclear facility for more than 30 years, Knowledge and expertise in nuclear and reactor engineering has declined in the Philippines. The objective of PRR1 Saturn is to establish PRR1 as a subcritical assembly with provisions for zero power critical assembly. So Saturn stands for subcritical assembly for training, education, and research. So that is Saturn. And this is the relative location of SATR assembly with respect to the existing structures of PRR1. And the SATR assembly, all the structures will be new and fabrication will include appropriate qualification processes, including new core support structure. Just some facility description. For your PRR1 SATR, it is slightly irrigated Riga or it will use slightly irrigated Riga fuel in order to avoid uh, more nuclear waste by using a new fuel. It has low absolute amount of nuclear fuel, your uranium-235, less than 5 kilograms. And any fuel configuration should remain subcritical with coefficient um, of less than 0 0.97. Zero power operation at ambient temperature and pressure and inherently safety pressures because of the negative coefficient, coefficient of reactivity and the fuel matrix. And it will also be compliant to national regulations and follow international recommendations. 
These are the facility objectives of SATR to support, accommodate, train, engage, and repurpose, support nuclear manpower development, which is very tam timely, uh, timely because of the signing of Executive Order 116, which we're going to discuss in the next session, and to accommodate local access to operating nuclear facility, to train reactor operators, users, and regulators, to engage stakeholders in nuclear and reactor in engineering, and to repurpose resources of historical PR1 facility that were not used. This is the utilization plan of the PR1 satellite cap capabilities. We have few, uh, full utilization for public awareness to conduct of awareness or seminars, technical visits, and public communication for peaceful use of nuclear energy. We will have medium uh, utilization for nuclear education in reactor physics and engineering, nuclear physics, the symmetry, nuclear safety, reactor experiments in practical training of students, and also medium utilization plan for capacity building for nuclear power. For reactor physics and engineering, reactor operation, nuclear safety, nuclear security, nuclear material accounting and control, and nuclear facility regulation. And just a low utilization for research and development or services or neutronic and reactor kinetic studies, reactor model valid validation, neutron spectrometry, small scale neutron activation analysis, and low flux neutron irradiation. Though uh, we will have here this low utilization, but this is more than enough um, uh, for the nuclear cap capability of the country. This is the SATER project timeline. And it is um, hoped to be uh, commissioned in December of 2021, and it will be uh, operational by 2022. And these are the references which you can view for more studies. Thank you for listening.